Hello students, this is Professor Del Russo and you're about to hear the lecture for February 22nd, 2012. Two things. One, the lecture got cut a little bit short, uh, but most of the information is there. Secondly, there's a section in the lecture where I talk about guardian ad litems and guardians for children in family court matters. I expressed that I did not know a lot about the issue and about the guardian ad litem or the guardian. One thing I said that was wrong though, I said that the guardian ad litem is an attorney. Uh, that's not true. Now I posted in the Cyber Cafe the rules of court on these issues. There are two types of persons that are appointed to assist the court in family court matters and they are distinguishable. One is called a court appointed counsel. Now the court appointed counsel acts as an independent legal advocate for the best interests of the child and they're involved in the hearing. They're a lawyer. They can subpoena witnesses, cross-examine witnesses. They can appeal if it's warranted. They are a legal advocate. They're called court appointed counsel. Now their role, as I said a moment ago, is the best interest of the child. Now DIFUS and the Deputy Attorney General are both focused on the best interests of a child, but they're also paying attention to overall risk. Their perspective might be different from this court appointed counsel. Now the guardian ad litem, the guardian ad litem is an independent fact finder. They're more of an investigator than a lawyer. They go out and gather information in the field and then they come back and report to the court. They don't have to be a lawyer. They could be. They could be a social worker, a mental health professional, or some other person that might be appropriate. Sometimes they need a guardian ad litem to act as an expert. So they might pick a person from a specialized field like a psychologist if there are some mental health issues and the court needs an investigation, an unbiased investigation on behalf of the child. So the court might point a guardian ad litem from that discipline and expect a report and even testimony. The guardian ad litem ultimately might testify before the court in the family court action. So I hope this clears things up a little bit. Again, you have a court appointed counsel who's supposed to act in the best interest of the child and they're a lawyer and they act like a lawyer, they cross-examine, they subpoena, they appeal if necessary. And then you have the guardian ad litem who is an investigator for the court, they act on behalf of the child and they can come from any discipline and sometimes they are selected primarily because of their discipline to be an expert. And they don't act as a lawyer, they act as an investigator and they bring information back to the court and bring that information in an effort to further the best interest of the child. Here is the lecture from February 22nd, 2012. Okay, today is February 22nd, 2012. This is Children and Justice, and I want to um, wrap up Learning Module 2. We're largely over it, and you're supposed to be in the middle of Learning Module 3, um, but I recalled uh, a few things that I left out from last week. One is on the issue of plea bargains. On the issue of plea bargains, we talked about a lot of aspects of the mutual benefits of plea bargains. We talked about the three main reasons that we have plea bargains. Economy, finality, and certainty. Economy also meaning efficiency. Efficiency slash economy, finality, and certainty. And we talked about the mutual benefits to the accused and the victim. But one of the things that the victim takes away from a plea bargain that you don't get with a criminal trial, and this is important, it really is for the victims, is that a guy can go to trial and be convicted by jury or by judge and still deny his responsibility. He can still proclaim his innocence. He could spend the next 50 years in jail and claim he's innocent. He never has to admit the offense. He doesn't even have to take the stand. He simply sits in court and waits for the prosecution to prove the case. And if the prosecution proves it, he goes to jail for a little time or a long time, he never has to admit it. One thing you do get 
with the plea bargain is the defendant has to walk into courtroom and say what he did. He has to admit the crime. That's called a factual basis. Factual. F-A-C-T-U-A-L. Factual. Factual basis. He has to give a factual basis. He has to explain to the court why he's guilty of the crime that he's pleading guilty to. What he did. Often judges say, what is it that makes you guilty? Now what happens is the victim can come to that proceeding. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. More often they don't. They more typically come to the sentencing, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the fact of the matter is, he admitted it. And that can be very important to a victim, very validating, right? He said he did it. Especially if it's your father or your uncle or your mother's cousin or the coach or your neighbor or your priest or your probation officer, or someone you knew, someone you trusted, someone you loved, someone you cared about, someone a lot of other people care about, know, love, and trust. Someone that a lot of people declared falsely accused. Someone who a lot of people felt that the victim was a liar and fabricating this allegation. And there was a lot of community support for it. It's nice when they come in and say they did it. They can go to trial and be convicted. And the dozen jurors and the parties to the prosecution may know the truth. But the rest of the people may still feel the guy got railroaded. That's why sometimes, depending upon the case, it's a good idea to take a plea, even if there's something really less, especially if there's a lot of community support. You know, it's nice one day, even if the guy's getting probation, it's nice some days when he goes into court and he admits he did it. And then all of a sudden they turn on him and they say, my God, I never thought he did it. I am so betrayed. Well, you're betrayed? What about the kid? In any event, a plea bargain requires that the accused come in and say they did it. And you don't get that with a trial. No matter how overwhelming the evidence, no matter how quick the jury returns a verdict, no matter how angry the judge is on sentence day, no matter how severe the sentence, some kids say, but he never said he did it. And I tell them, and other prosecutors tell them, that that's just the way it goes, you know, we believe you, and the jury believed you, and that's what's important. And we cannot reach down into their soul and pull out remorse. And sometimes these guys are so bad that they'll never admit it. They're so bad that they don't care. The very kind of psychopathy, the very kind of badness that leads to the offense that they did is the same kind of badness that fuels their indifference and their utter moral repugnance when they walk into a courtroom. They didn't care about the kid when they crawled into her bed at night. Why should they give a damn about her now? Now sometimes some of these offenders do have remorse. Sometimes they do have a conscience. Depends on the kind of sex offender. The morally bankrupt sex offender is actually kind of rare. Uh, but they're out there. They're out there. So getting back to plea bargains, if someone pleads guilty, you may only get three years instead of 20, but you get a guy to come in and say, I did it. And that's valuable to kids. I'm telling you, it's valuable to kids. You can think about it for a moment and put yourself in the shoes of an aggrieved person, someone who's victimized, especially by someone you knew, and tr you knew loved, and trusted. It might be very valuable to hear them come in and say they did it. So I left that out last week, and that's important about plea bargains. Part of plea bargaining involves sentencing. In fact, I never really gave you a definition of plea bargaining. Plea bargaining is when the prosecution offers something less than the statute provides as a sentence. So if the statute says you can get between 10 and 20 years, the prosecutor can offer you something less than the maximum. So 10 to 20 years, 
We'll offer you 10 to 13 years. We'll offer you 7 years. We'll offer you 5 years. And that's why it's valuable for the defense, for the defendant, for the accused. Because you eliminate the most severe aspects of the sentence, the highest numbers. So instead of walking into court on sentence day, the bad guy faces a 20, he walks in on sentence day and he faces 13 or 12 or 6. The plea bargain sets a ceiling. It doesn't set a floor. It does not bind the judge. The judge is not required to do any particular sentence. She simply cannot go over the top number. So if the number is between 5 and 13, the judge cannot give a sentence more than 13. Now, if the judge wants to give a sentence more than 13, because they think the crime is so horrible, and I mentioned that at the end of class last week, then they can throw out the plea. They can refuse to accept the plea and tell the prosecutor, we're not doing it, start over. They have the authority to do that. Very rarely do they invoke that authority, but they could do that. So the prosecutor now creates an artificial ceiling. What could have been a 20-year sentence is now only a 13-year sentence. That doesn't mean the judge is going to give 13, just means you can't go any higher than 13. The judge might give a 7, a 9, a 12, a 6. But you can't go over 13. And that gives the defendant some of that certainty I talked about, right? They know that they're not going to do any worse than 13. And they got their fingers crossed that they're going to do a lot better than 13, because they could. So sentencing is involved in plea bargaining. It's part of the definition of plea bargaining. Talking quickly about sentencing law in New Jersey, I expressed to you last week that the traditional justifications for sentencing throughout America, throughout Anglo-American jurisprudence, British and American kind of justice systems, you have the same themes for criminal sentencing. Retribution, just deserts, <coughs> which is a form of... It's a form of saying that a person got what they deserved. Just deserts, retribution, deterrence. Specific deterrence and general deterrence we talked about last week. Punishment. Rehabilitation. So the big ones are retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation, and just desserts. Which is not a new yogurt place on West 4th Street. It's a legal principle that suggests that the public, the citizenry, feel that there's there's just the deserts. It's two S's, D-E-S, D-E-S-S-E-R-T-S. And it's the notion that he got what he deserved, that there's equity in the world, that something has been made right. That's a little bit different from revenge, right? Revenge is more emotional, more passionate. The guy is a bum. He should, he should be punished. That's revenge. Just deserves his, he got what he deserves. A little bit different spin on it. <coughs> Sentencing theory. Deterrence. I talked about deterrence, right? Specific in general, I talked about the mothers against drunk driving and how people don't drive drunk that much anymore how laws have changed, people will stop texting one day while they're driving. If enough people die, enough people pass laws and you go to jail and they take away your license or it costs you a thousand dollars in motor vehicle points, you will stop texting and driving. There will be a deterrent. That's deterrence. <coughs> well, and then there's revenge or retribution. Now, that, the, that guides legislatures in deciding how much, how much a crime is worth in any given state. Those kind of notions that I just gave you, those traditional justifications for sentencing. And I also 
suggested that what really governs this whole thing is blameworthiness. The more blameworthy you are, the more morally culpable you are, the higher the sentence is going to be. The less blameworthy the crime, the less offended our sensibilities are, the citizen sensibilities, the less severe the punishment is going to be, the less severe the outcome. So you have kidnapping. That's a real serious offense. Kidnapping for ransom. Kidnapping to interfere with the parental rights of another. In New Jersey, there are four degrees of crime. Fourth degree, third degree, second degree, and first degree. That's how we break up crimes in New Jersey. Fourth degree is the least serious crime. The sentencing exposure, that helps us define the crime. The sentencing exposure is 0 to 18 months. So a criminal sexual contact is up to a year and a half in jail. No more than that. I often give the example of the Burger King uh, assistant manager who uh, uh, touches the butt of the French fryer girl without her permission. That is a criminal sexual contact. We know about MTS, right? It's not that they're free to firmly provide permission from the perspective of the reasonable person in the actor's shoes. So the assistant manager, the average reasonable assistant manager had no right to touch her buttocks. And if he does, it's a fourth degree crime. If it's a child under 13, same act. Second degree crime. What's a second degree crime? Five to 10 years in jail. Fourth degree, zero to 18. I skip third degree because of my hypotheticals. Third degree is three to five. Second degree is five to ten. And first degree is ten to twenty. Those are what we call crimes. I mentioned also that there are these things called offenses. They are analogous to what we call misdemeanors in other states. We don't use misdemeanors in New Jersey. Uh, they're not crimes. If you were convicted of a disorderly person's offense, let's say you were joyriding or you were a, a graffiti artist and you defaced some public property and you were charged with criminal mischief, you know, you get hauled off to municipal court, you can get fined, you can get up to six months in jail on a disorderly person's offense. Up to six months in jail. There ain't no jury trial. All of the rights under the Constitution do not apply. You go to municipal court, or as people down at the courthouse like to call it, small court, or little court, or baby court. It's none of those things. Serious things happen. Most people's only contact with the criminal justice system, or the justice system for that matter, most people's is at the municipal court level. Whether it be a parking ticket, or a traffic stop, or a speeding ticket, or some other ordinance violation. The vast majority of Americans, the only time they're ever in a courthouse is the local courthouse, if they ever go there. They very rarely in Superior Court. My father was a sheriff's officer in Essex County after he retired from the post office. And I would go visit him when I was a kid, and I was fascinated. I walked in on a murder trial once. I thought I died and went to heaven. It was, it was like, it was so cool, man. <laughs> they were talking about how someone who's not here anymore, who got killed, he got shot, and he's laying in a pool of blood. I was like, this is so crazy. And I sat there for hours just watching this thing. And it seemed so formal and majestic and important and serious and was all those things in a way. Municipal court's a little bit different. And those kinds of offenses are handled at the municipal court level that I just described. If you are guilty of criminal mischief, or you are guilty of joyriding, you're guilty of harassment, that's another disorderly person's offense, you're not guilty of a crime. If you're ever asked whether you have been convicted of a crime, let's say you're filling out a job application, I'm not saying it's a good thing to have an offense under your belt. What I'm saying is it's not a crime. I want you to understand that. If they ask you whether you were convicted of a crime in New Jersey, you were not. It's not a crime. It's an offense. It's an offense. And we, we treat them differently. Other states call them felonies and misdemeanors. So you could maybe wrap your mind around it a little bit better, because that's what they use on TV most of the time. I'm the felony prosecution unit. 
New Jersey would call them crimes and offenses. Now you have those first degree crimes. I told you it's 10 to 20 years in jail. There's some fancy crimes like kidnapping, which has up to 30 years in jail. Some crimes have mandatory sentences before you're allowed to be on parole. <coughs> and what I mean by that is, let's say the stepfather fondles the buttocks of the eight-year-old girl. I told you the same kind of act that with the French fryer girl on a child gets you a second-degree sentence. It's a second-degree crime. So fondling of a child under 13, over the clothes, we'll call it, for what that's worth, if it has any meaning at all. It's a second degree crime. Five to ten years in jail. Now let's say you get sentenced to five years. In nine months, you can apply to the parole board for early release. Doesn't mean you get out. I get upset for those conservative law and order folk. Doesn't mean you get out. It means you get to go there and say, hey, here's my application. I want to get in queue, as they say in England. I want to get on line to have my case heard. I want to be released. I haven't set any fires. I haven't punched anybody. I've worked in the commissary. I go to the library every day. I mop the floors. Whatever you do, I've earned all the good credits. <clears throat> the average person on a five-year sentence might get out in a year and a month, let's say reasonable. You may not think it's reasonable, but that's how it works. There's this thing called parole. We talked about that on the tail end of last class. Parole is when you're done with your sentence, you get integrated or transitioned back into the community under supervision. Right? That's parole. Now, I brought this up in the context of sentencing. That same guy, let's say he had a prior record. Let's say he had two other offenses, a robbery and a, and a, and a manslaughter serious prior record. Well, we may give him that same five years with what's called a period of parole ineligibility, where the judge can impose a five-year sentence and a period where he cannot be considered for parole, up to two and a half years. So the average five-year guy walks in, he can go there in nine months with his application all filled out. This guy's got to wait two and a half years or he can go there with his application filled out. That doesn't mean he gets it at the two and a half year point. That means he puts it on the pile with the nine month guys and the other guys. So, no, but they call that stip. That is shorthand. That's prison jargon for a stipulated sentence. Yo, man, I don't want no stip. Can you get me a flat five? Every business, every profession has its own jargon, its own way of talking, its own way of shorthand, linguistic shorthand for what they do. So, yo, man, I don't want to stick. Every defendant I've ever met, because I've tried with many, many defendants, and I've met many of them uh, because we prosecuted them over the years, and, and if I ever had to talk to them, talking about prison language and lingo. What I, what I say is this. I never say, what did you do or what are you charged with? Because you'll see what I mean in a minute. I learned that first year. I say, yo, what did they say you did? Because everybody's innocent. <laughs> and if they're not innocent, they ain't admitting they're guilty. And they're not going to admit it to me, the prosecutor, even if I'm chit-chatting or I admire their shirt or they got a cool pair of shoes or they're wearing a Ferragamo tie. That's, 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 that's not the kind of dialogue you're going to have with me. And if you say it even more gener generically, you know, uh, you know, what are you charged with? Well, they say I raped her. Well, they say I broke into the store. It's always what they say. It's kind of a shorthand way of saying I'm accused of X, but I didn't do it. So anyway, you won't you don't want a stip, man. No, can you get rid of the stip? Can you get me a flat? Get me a five flat? I told you what a five flat is, that means there's no two and a half year parole ineligibility. Just a flat old conventional garden variety sentence. Now, one of the things we need to remember about parole, you know, people think parole's a bad thing too. 
No more parole. Abolish parole. No early release. And we have no early release in New Jersey. We abolish parole for a lot of offenses. You have to serve 85% of your sentence now in some cases. So now you get a 5 with 85. That's virtually all of your sentence, right? The last 15%, they need to process your paperwork and get your toothbrush ready and find out where your clothes are and all that. So, you know, that's that's not meaningful. You know, 85 of 10 is 8 years and 6 months. 85, yeah, probably something like that. So, you know, you, you're, you're about to be released. So you know what they did? They added on a period of supervision beyond that. So you get out in eight years and six months on a 10-year with 85, no early release, get rid of parole. And they get five years extra supervision. Clever. And the reason why I suggested a moment ago to say that, you know, it's, pro it's myopic, it's narrow-minded, it's short-sighted, it's, it's naive to say that we need to keep people in jail to the last day. No early release, no parole for bad guys. My name is... What's the guy on Fox News that's got the show that has all the high ratings? Bill O'Reilly, no release. Do not release rapists, ever. No early release, abolish parole. Is well, the reason... For minors as well? What's that? Is this for minors? No, no, juveniles are a whole different thing. They don't have parole steps. The sentencing model is fundamentally different. Um, no, but this is for adults. And... It's naive because you simply cannot, you know, although Hollywood makes you think so, you see all these guys walking out out the big gates and looking up and coming out of jail and breathing in the fresh air. It don't work that way. Um, they just came out with Wall Street, well, it was last year or two years ago. The new Wall Street, well, Wall Street was a movie in the 80s. A new Wall Street came out last year with a new guy playing the Charlie Scene character type guy. Although he made a cameo. Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf. And, and Gordon Gecko was the name of the uh, uh, Wall Street guy in the 80s. And he went to jail, which was a nice backstory to have for the new movie because a lot of guys from that era went to prison because they were corrupt. Uh, and he gets out of jail and he's going to get his things. And if you watch the first movie, there's a classic scene with him talking on the beach on a cell phone. And the phone's this big with an antenna like that. He's got his flip-flops on, his, you know, polo pants with the big polo guy on and all that. Um, but when he goes and gets his things among his items, he's been in jail since 1980s, 2011 or 10 or whenever. He, here's your thing. They give him that giant cell phone. One cell phone! And they put this big brick on the table. <laughs> And then he walks out of the prison gates and, you know, he's out, he's, like I just described, breathing the fresh air, and he's, you know, he's ruggedly handsome but much older and, you know, he's got gray hair now. And, you know, he was a billionaire in the 80s and all of a sudden this big black limo is pulling up, man. Tunes are blasting out of it, he's walking out and he stands there and all of a sudden the African-American dude comes back and jumps in with hip-hop, says hello to his friends and takes off in the limo and a cab pulls up for him. So the, um, uh, the expectation was he was a jump in the limo, but times have changed. Um, and guys like him ain't making money anymore. In any event, um, you know, you can't just put them out on the street with the toothbrush and tell them that's it. You need a period of transition. You need a period of transition because the hope is that these people can come back to society and be contributing and productive. You know, you just don't want to throw them out to the curb with their toothbrush at their giant cell phone and say, go find a job and nice seeing you. I mean, that's not in society's interest, right? So you need a period of transition. You need some help reintegrating into the society. Um, although rehabilitation is not that important in the criminal justice system anymore, you still need to do some of that. And there are plenty of opportunities for rehabilitation in jail, plenty of opportunities for education if you want to do it if you want to do it. And there is still a sophisticated system of parole excuse me, that helps to get people back into the swing of things, get back into society um, without harming other people. The other reason parole is important is, is because and why the release date is dynamic, it changes, is because you need to enforce prison order. That's 
why you have what are called good time credits. For every day that you do good in jail and don't burn a place down or punch someone in the jaw or do bad things, you get two good time credits. Or maybe three, I don't even know. But in New Jersey, every state's different. Good time. And they're not credits, you know, to have a good time some other day. For good time. They refer to if you do good time, you get rewarded. So if you do one day of good time, you get two days off your sentence. So for every 30 days, you get 60 days. And you take that off the back end number. So if you're looking at 20 years, and let me tell you, nobody's better at math than a guy in jail. Nobody <laughs> can count better and has the mastery of a calendar better than a guy in jail. So if you've got 20 years in jail, you get the calendar. You did 30 good days, you get 60 in return, you go to the 20, what is it, 2012, you go to 20, uh, 20, 2032, you chop off six months backwards. Now you got your new date. So for every good day, you get two days off of your sentence. And that's how you get, in part, partly how you figure out parole release time. Well, then the opposite happens. They take away good time credits, or you don't get any good time credits. And then there's other institutional ways to enforce order, solitary confinement, loss of privileges, you know, uh, visitation is truncated, um, and, and you need to do that. And my point is, not only are there those kind of punitive things that you can do, um, but you need an incentive for people to do good things. Otherwise, why would anybody, you know, you're dealing with a population that's a little hard scrabble and rough and tumble. I mean, these, these guys are tough. They're not rule followers, right, by definition. Now you've got hundreds of them in a small space. So how do, you, how do you encourage them to do the right thing? Well, it's hard enough to do the right thing with this complex, systems of, complex system of rewards and punishments. But that's what you do. You work at the prison gift shop or whatever, sweep it up, you get two good time days. You have a good day, you get two good time days. You know? You do something wrong, you get a day off. You get to do something right, you get two days. You get three days, whatever. There's a whole hierarchy of rewards and punishments. It's very basic. It's almost preschool-like. But you're dealing with people on a fundamental level here. You're dealing with them and trying to encourage them not to harm others. And they're there for that very reason. They harm people. And they're in a powder keg. Anyway, so that's parole. Probation's a little bit different. All of the kinds of conditions that you can attach to bail, I told you, you can attach to probation. Probation is in lieu of jail. Parole is, and in lieu of means instead of jail. And parole means um, after jail. It doesn't mean that, but that's, that's the upshot of it. Any questions about that stuff? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the question is, when I mentioned supervision earlier, that parole is a period of post-release supervision, was I referring to what I talked about also a moment ago, the transition, or transitioning from jail to civilian life? Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it in part. The transition, transition is going from one thing to another, and that's part of it. Once they're at the other, there's this supervision too to make sure it sticks, right? That they're following what's expected of them, that they're getting job training, that they are getting substance abuse counseling, that they are doing what's necessary to address whatever deficits they have in their existence that cause them to affect. So it's part of the supervision transitions them from, you know, custody to freedom and the rest of the supervision is designed to, to um, allow them to be self-sufficient while they are free one day. Oh, yeah, they help them find jobs. Uh, they try, yeah. Go to any car wash, man. You'll find six, seven guys on parole any day of the week. <laughs> Do you have, um, like, one of those houses where I 
Yes. Yes. I don't know if it's mandatory, but it probably is. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on parole, but uh, halfway houses are transitional housing. That's exactly a transitional aspect of release. And you go there, and, and, and interestingly, if you are in a halfway house where you have general autonomy, you can do what you want most of the time, although there's rules about getting up, coming home, curfews, and all that, think places you got to be, but you can do what you want much of the time as well. But if you don't come home for one day, if you don't come home for curfew, uh, that's considered escape. And you'll be charged with escape, which is a serious offense. It's the same thing as if you busted a hole in the wall at the you know, Northern State Prison and climbed out on a rope and you know, hitched a ride on the parkway and fled. Not coming back to your halfway house is an act of escape. So you're considered in custody there, even though you're in this transitional housing. You're considered in custody. But for the average parolee, he's happy, man. He's out. He can breathe the air. He can do what he wants. He can crank up the radio. He can, you know, play with his gadget, whatever. Yes? You mentioned earlier that it doesn't seem that um, a lot of concentration is placed on trying to rehabilitate people in prison anymore. Is that a trend, and what is it that made people go away from that idea that that should happen? Well, again, I'm not an expert on these things. The pendulum has swung, and the what I was suggesting last week was that the emphasis in most states is on punishment now. Uh, there was a time where the emphasis was on rehabilitation. And the consciousness, the conscience of the community ebbs and flows. Sometimes we're in a bit a little bit of a sometimes we are in a little bit of a social worker mood for six or seven years, then there's some horrible crime, and everybody becomes uh, a law and order person. Um, and legislatures follow the public sentiment. The public wins, if you will. And, you know, just put on conservative television. And, you know, they're, they're always suggesting some more draconian uh, way of dealing with, some more severe way of punishing bad guys who do bad things. And it's almost always on the heels of some tragedy. Uh, where someone utterly innocent was brutalized in some way. Uh, so the focus uh, still is on rehabilitation in the jails. There's still components of your incarceration involve rehabilitation. But sentencing is more about punishment now than rehabilitation. It's not like, well, let's see how much time he needs before he gets better. Judges don't think that way anymore. In fact, in the California Constitution, uh, it said... They amended the Constitution, I think in the 1980s, I'd have to look that up though, to say the purpose of criminal sentencing in the state of California is to punish. Pure and simple. Forget about just desserts and rehabilitation or whatever. It's to punish. Let there be no mistake in California. So that's what I mean. The trend is towards that, and I still think that's the, the feeling among most. But rehabilitation has never been completely lost because you have to, you know, you have to do something to simply warehousing these people, these criminals, is not in society's best interest. Any other questions? I want to touch upon the process for child protection proceedings. We talked a lot about the criminal justice system. <clears throat> There's a parallel system called the civil system of justice. The events that unfold there are very similar to the events that unfold in the criminal courts when it comes to child protection. Excuse me. In discussing the cultural defense and its irrelevancy in child protection law last week, we learned that the criminal justice system's focus is largely on the intent of the accused, whether they meant to do it, whether they're blameworthy, right? I mentioned that earlier when we talk about sentencing. 
Did they do something that's morally offensive and did they mean it? In the criminal justice system, if you are mentally ill or you're a incompetent, we don't hold you responsible. Or if you're justified, we don't hold you responsible. You may have piled all of the bank's money into a bag and given it to some other person, but we don't hold you responsible if there's a gun in your face. You may have been complicit in theft by giving the money to the bad guy, but you were under duress. You weren't blameworthy. You didn't mean it. It's not your fault. You're not culpable. You're not responsible. The criminal justice system is focused on personal responsibility. Not so the civil system. The civil system, when I say the civil system, the child protection system, the child protection system is focused on risk of harm to kids. And unfortunately, it's immaterial that the caregiver can't get out of bed because she was gang raped by a bunch of bad guys. And it's not her fault. And she's having post-traumatic stress and she sees you know, visions of being attacked. She has visions and post-traumatic uh, delusions. If that makes her unable to care for her kids, those kids have to be taken and placed somewhere until she gets better. Or she needs to be treated or there needs to be an intervention. Neglect has occurred. Now, there are ways to treat her versus somebody who's out smoking crack and neglecting their kids differently within the child protection system. But either way, DIFUS is going to be in those women's lives or men's lives. It's mostly women as the caregivers. Personal responsibility, intent, is largely irrelevant in child protection. The focus is on potential harm to kids. If you habitually get caught in traffic and aren't there to take the babysitters, you know, pay the babysitter and let her go day after day and the babysitter leaves, you didn't want to neglect your kids. That's probably a bad example because there's some intent there. There's some, you should have known better. You're not completely blameless like the lady who has PTSD. In any event, I think you get the picture. It's about risk of harm to the kids, not the motives of the caregiver. Neglect can happen intentionally and maliciously, or neglect can happen innocently. And other acts of abuse can occur either way. The focus is on the harm to the kids. Nevertheless, often the same kind of facts provide the basis for abuse and neglect in the criminal courts as in the family courts. You know, I prosecuted a case once where the mother was smoking crack and Habitually smoking crack, fell asleep in a wicker chair, her cigarette fell into the chair, she stumbled into the kitchen, passed out somewhere, and the chair caught fire, and the children, some died, some survived horribly disfigured, and one survived rather unscathed. Um, terrible case, terrible case, uh, terrible act of neglect. You know, child protection came in that woman's life right away. We prosecuted her. They filed actions to eliminate the risk of harm to her kids. I don't want to say take away the kids. The purpose isn't to take away the kids. Even that mom may deserve to get those kids back one day. I mean, you can't think of a worse outcome. But that was a criminal prosecution and a civil matter, a family court matter. The mother who tethers her kid to the parking meter, if we were to prosecute that person in New Jersey, she could give us her cultural defense. If she would be prosecuted, she could be prosecuted in the criminal law under the neglect law. Remember Title 963, endangering the welfare of a child, Chapter 24-4. She could be prosecuted as a criminal there. And also, child protection can come into her life 
and explain to her what neglect means. I don't even want to say in America, what neglect means. And there could be a family court intervention to make sure it doesn't happen again. The remedies and ways of dealing with the mother who tethers her kid to the parking meter or the mother who burns the house down because she's so high on drugs uh, are similar. Different acts, different levels of sadness and risk and different harms that could befell the child or that did befall the children. Uh, but the arsenal of remedies that Dyfus has are many. You don't have to take the kids away. In fact, that's a last resort. There's lots of things that they can do to make sure that these kids aren't at risk anymore. Simple as that. That's all we want to do. And you are compelled to work with the caregiver, not to be punitive. You're compelled to make this caregiver a better parent. That's what it's all about, child protection. Not me. I'm going to put the lady in jail. She's bad. She's malicious. She's blameworthy. That's the prosecution's role. That doesn't happen in every case. Many cases we see it the same way. I'm not here to step on, you know, slightly neglectful caregivers. But my point is there's different roles. The purpose of the criminal justice system is retribution, punishment. Child protection, you have to take reasonable efforts to make sure that they are a good parent. Those kids are protected. We want kids to grow up in homes where they got parents. Their parents care for them and love them and hug them and help them with their homework and drive them to games and do all the things that good parents are supposed to do. That's what we want in this country. And if somehow that gets interrupted for whatever reason, government steps in. That's the model. There are millions of stories out there and millions of ways that things don't always work out as planned. But the model is, is to make these parents do the right thing. Not to step on the family unit and disrupt it. So what happens is there's a person called a deputy attorney general. That is the equivalent of the prosecutor in a child protection matter. In New Jersey, the Division of Youth and Family Services, DIFUS, our child protection unit, is represented by a deputy attorney general. The deputy attorney general prosecutes the case, and I'm using that word generically. They present the case to the family court on behalf of child protection, if it gets to that level. Most people simply accept whatever remedy there is, and they cooperate with child protection. Sometimes they don't, and there needs to be litigation. Now, even though the even though both Dyfus excuse me a minute, a little more. Even though Dyfus is not interested in holding people responsible for their behavior or punishing their punishing people, even if it's simply about risk of harm to kids, and the criminal justice system is interested in whether the person was malicious or whether the person intended on harming someone, even though what we do is fundamentally different, child protection and law enforcement, the cases unfold very similarly. So the Deputy Attorney General who's prosecuting or handling or presenting the case of the lady who tethered the child to the parking meter, or the woman whose cigarette caused a catastrophic fire, that Deputy Attorney General is presenting the case in family court. I'm presenting the case in criminal court. We're going to rely on the same evidence. It's going to look very similar. Same kinds of witnesses, same kind of testimony. The difference is in, in a child protection proceeding, there ain't no jury. There's no constitutional right to remain silent. There's no constitutional right to a jury trial. Judge is going to make a decision. The deputy attorney general can call the mother to the stand. If it was me, I would call the woman from the Netherlands to the stand. Probably be my first witness. Call your first witness. You. Take the seat. Let's find out what happened that day. You had a cocktail on that stand. So it's different. 
in some aspects, but ultimately, the evidence is the evidence. The information is the information. And in order to find out what happened, you need to put on a case, you need to put on witnesses, you need to put on evidence. Both the division and the prosecution need to know what happened. What we do with that what happened, what we do with the information is quite different. But the litigation is a what happened event. What the hell happened here? So to that extent, we're doing the same thing. So let's take a look at some of the procedures in family court. Every state calls their complaint something different. A petition or a complaint. It's a formal document that alleges child maltreatment. A lot of cases of child maltreatment involve a quick removal. They call that in New Jersey informally a Dodd. Dodd was the senator from South Orange, I think, or from Essex County, who passed the law many years ago that allowed for this emergency removal. He was one of the sponsors. So a Dodd removal is an emergency removal. For example, in my office, if a child makes an allegation against her stepfather, we arrest the stepfather for sexually molesting her. The mother says, I don't believe her, she's a liar, I don't believe my child. Well, that child and her siblings can't go home to that house because the mother doesn't believe the child. She's emphatic that her daughter's a liar. She's not going to protect her daughter. If he makes bail again, or he makes bail that night, she's going to let him back in the house. <coughs> One example where the division will take that child and put them in an emergency placement. The preference is to put them with someone they know, kin, a kin, kin, a relative. If that fails, then unfortunately, well, I should say fortunately, I shouldn't look at it as a negative. For the child, it's a negative because they don't know the person. But if, it fa if they fail to file, find someone who the child knows or a relative or kin, and then they go to a foster placement. Sometimes temporarily, sometimes for a long time. Depends upon mom's position in, in that case or that scenario. Sometimes both the mother and the father are defendants. Many times there ain't no father. Well, there's always a father, but he ain't around. You know, so the mother who burned the house down those children had to be placed with foster parents, eventually. There had to be some kind of alternate arrangement made. They were immediately, well, they were in a hospital, and, and the, so that's kind of not a good example, but, you know, the woman, even the woman who tethered her child to the, you know, to the uh, parking meter, she's going to spend the night away from her children until they figure out what's going on. Now, that case, there might have been options not to even place her children for one moment somewhere, but, you know, most neglect cases, you're going to, and you're the sole caregiver, you've demonstrated that you are legally neglectful. You're not going to get your kid tonight. We need to figure this out. They have to go somewhere. We're intervening because you're putting this child at substantial risk, unfair risk. We can't send them home with you because, we, you know, well, you come back to court. Maybe you didn't do it. You have a right to... No, it don't work that way. The paramount interest is the safety of the kid. So a lot of times the kids are taken emerge for emerge in an emergency situation. And there's a lot of emergencies in the world of child protection. They're taken away for a day or two. In New Jersey, they call that a dot removal or an emergency removal. There are rules and laws about how soon after you have to file a complaint or petition before the family court to sort this whole thing out. The bottom line is it has to be done virtually simultaneously, if not the next morning. And these complaints are complaints that are filed by the Attorney General in New Jersey and they allege child maltreatment. And they explain what the act of abuse is.
And these complaints have to be communicated to the parties. If there's a complaint that accuses a caregiver of neglect, you have to serve them with the complaint or provide a means of notifying them that there's going to be a, a hearing about this. In the case of a Dodd removal, that's going to be within a day or two. A family court judge is going to hear that. It's essentially what's called in the law an order to show cause. You don't really need to know about that. The bottom line is there's some serious accusations here, and we need to protect the children and maintain the safety of the child, and the caregiver has to come in and explain what's going on or show cause about what's happening. There's temporary restraints that are issued, and those restraints are against the caregiver with regard to the child. As your assignments indicate, ideally no child should be removed from a family until after a petition is filed. But I just explained to you a lot of times they are those kind of emergency or Dodd removals. At this initial hearing, you know, if the lady who tethered their kid to the parking meter has her child placed with a relative or in foster care on a Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning or latest Wednesday morning, she's going to be before a judge and she wants her child back. That hearing, a day or two later, requires certain people there. Obviously the caregiver. If there's a father, he needs to be notified. Extended family members, depending upon the nature of the abuse or neglect, they might be notified too. They may be considered placement options. You'll see words like GAL and CASA. The GAL is the guardian ad litem. And the CASA is the court-appointed special advocate. There are a number of these corollary functions in the child protection system that help the court make decisions. Now, the guardian typically represents the child or the child's perspective. That's different from the DAG's representation of the child. Well, I don't know if it's the law guardian. I have to look more into that. But a guardian... A tr you have to be sworn in. So I guess it is the law guardian. To be like a CASA volunteer, you have to be sworn in and to do like a rigorous vol like volunteer. Uh, yeah, no, the CASA is very different from a oh, guardian ad litem. A guardian ad litem is an attorney, and they represent the child. CASA is important, and they're mostly lay people who get involved, they get good training, and they're an important part of this. But the guardian is an attorney, um, and they're part of the Office of Public Defenders, the law guardian. And I have to flush this out a little bit more. I'm always a little confused about that. They may be two separate things. The law guardian may have different issues in mind or different obligations than the guardian ad litem. But I know that one of the guardians represents the child, the position of the child. And what that means is the deputy attorney general may think the child is better off with Uncle Mike. But the child doesn't want to be with Uncle Mike and rather be with Aunt Mary. And the guardian may say, listen, my client is 10-year-old Mikey. And he wants to be with his Aunt Mary. And I think that Aunt Mary's equally capable as Uncle Mike. Or whatever the names were, if I messed them up. So they may be at the initial hearing. They are probably not there uh, that early in the game. Um, but that is an opportunity for the court to think about whether you need a guardian, what the role of CASA is, and that kind of stuff. Most of the time, the matters are settled at these initial hearings. An agreement's made about where the child will stay in the interim, what things are need to be done. The person accepts that they did something wrong or they did something neglectful and that they're going to cooperate with DIFUS and the judge is going to review it in two weeks or this kind of thing. 
But sometimes you need to litigate this. That first hearing is just to decide whether DIFUS or Child Protection had the authority to remove those kids and whether they did it in the right way. Now, the judge may say, wait a minute, the woman's from Denmark, it's never happened before, she was watching outside the window. Uh, I, I find that even this first hearing, that DIFUS doesn't have enough evidence here. It's very rare, but it could happen. That initial hearing is to decide whether there's a basis to go forward. And sometimes the caregiver denies, wants to litigate it, wants to be heard. Later on, there's what's called in New Jersey a fact-finding. Maybe the petition alleges the mother was in the place having a drink, and I don't know whether she had an alcoholic beverage or not. I'm just kind of riffing off that New York case from 97. But maybe in the pleadings, Dyfa said she was drinking alcohol and she was in there for 30 minutes. And she was at the back bar. Maybe in reality, she was in there for four minutes. She maintained the line of sight with her daughter. And this is what they do in the Netherlands. And it wasn't neglect at all. Now the judge says, well, you know, if what Dyfa says is true, that could be neglect. I'm not going to make that decision today. Um, we need to maintain the status quo. We can't let these children go because if what Dyfa says is true, you have not demonstrated you're a good caregiver, so we're going to have a hearing on this or a fact-finding, and that's going to be on March 31st, 2012. See you then. Everybody's got to get subpoenas, the guardian, all kind of people have to be notified for this fact-finding. One thing that does happen, you'll see on the big board, is something called discovery. I'm going to talk about discovery in this context, but it happens in the criminal justice system and it happens in the family court as well. Discovery is the process in which attorneys exchange information. So in the case of child protection, the deputy attorney general has to give to the parents' attorneys everything they're going to rely upon at that backfinding. DIFUS records, police reports, maybe they're interested in what the weather was and they're going to rely upon what the weather is. If they have a report from the, you know, the New York City Weather Service they're going to rely upon, that report has to be given to the family's attorneys. All of the evidence that they're going to rely upon at this fact-finding has to be given to the lawyer for the caregiver. I'm going to switch it to the criminal law. The prosecution has to give the defendant all of the evidence they're going to rely upon in the prosecution. If the prosecutor finds evidence that they're not going to use, but maybe, may be favorable to the defendant, you got to turn it over. The discovery rules that govern criminal prosecutions are very rigorous. So if you interviewed a witness and they said, you know what? The, the guy I saw that went into the quick check store and waved the gun around, he was a short guy with sandy blonde hair. And you got 20 witnesses who say he was a tall guy with dark black hair. And this person's got real thick glasses and they're a little shaky. You go, you know what, I ain't buying it. All right, we make notes of that. The police make notes of that. They throw it in the file. We're not going to use that in our case. Why would we put a witness on that's inconsistent with the vast majority of witnesses who finger this guy and who are able and definitive in their testimony in their sworn statements. Well, guess what? That interview with that sketchy guy who said it was a short guy with sandy blonde hair, got to turn that over to the defense. It may help him. It may cast a little doubt on what happened.
try to, I might have mentioned it, I think, maybe in this class, I don't know, a big burly guy that looked like John Candy who raped a woman who was a marathon runner. I mentioned that case. Well, during the prosecution, a receipt from a convenience store, like a quick check or a 7-Eleven, was critical because there was evidence that the defendant, the John Candy-looking guy, bought a quart of milk, a New York Post newspaper, and some other items at the quick check near his home in Clifton. And the bag in which he bought that stuff was still in his house when the police arrested him. And he called up his girlfriend and said, Hey, Barb, from the police station. And I have the call recorded. Barb, go get that bag with the receipt in it that's under the cupboard near the refrigerator from when I went to quick check this morning, or yesterday morning, whenever it was. Lo and behold, the girlfriend finds it and there's a receipt in there. And it says 7.14 a.m. on it. Now, the rape happened at 628 up in North Halden, which is a little bit of a ride to Clifton. So I had to figure out whether he could have did the rape in North Halden and still been at the Clifton Quick Check at 714. The way we did that simply was the sergeant who was investigating the case got in his car, drove at a reasonable pace, and was able to make it by like 7 o'clock. Maybe even 7.05. I don't remember. It was close, but it was doable. I put him on the stand. I said, did you drive there? I just drove, you know, the speed limit. So it was able to be done, and that was important to me. (laughs) Because if it couldn't be done without a rocket ship, I got the wrong guy. Anyway, it reminded me of when I had this shaky witness who said Sandy Brown hair. I, I found the lady who served him that day did the purchase. Lovely woman, probably in her mid-80s, though. And she came in and she was very shaky, very typically octogenarian, and, you know, had a little bit of a shake to her, and she took the witness stand, and Calman Geist, who's one of the most accomplished cross-examiners in America, was cross-examining her, and he knew, even he knew, who's got one speed, 100 miles an hour, you know, who's got one philosophy, destroy, uh, knew not to destroy this poor old woman. And he goes to her, uh, yeah, so you work at the Quick Check on Lakeview Avenue in Clifton, is that right? Tell us about the man you saw. Was he about six foot? Yeah. Was he? And he said he had brownish hair, right? Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he came into the store and he bought these items on there? That's right. Um... And he stands by me, Geist, and he goes, uh, did, did, he, did he look like this man here? She goes, yeah, not only did he look like him, that's him. This is the man right here. Are you sure about that? Yeah. And the man that came, no, he's not going to let, let's see, I have the receipt now. The man here bought the New York Post, is that right? Yeah. And he bought the milk container of milk that day, the man right here? Yeah, he did. And he bought the... The other thing, is that right? Okay, thank you so much. I said, I'll see you later, man. Thank you so much for coming. Now, she didn't identify me in any other context. It happened in court. Um, I had an alibi that day. I was not in town. Um, in any event, all she was identifying was the person who bought the stuff. And there was really no... I didn't put her on to identify Logmans, and I didn't ask her to identify the defendant. I just asked her to authenticate that receipt and say she worked that day, and this transaction happened. But Geist had a little fun with it and, and showed her to be a, re- a less than reliable witness, obviously. At least had bad eyesight, let's put it that way, and a bad recollection. Nevertheless, you have to give the defense anything that may help the defense. Anything. And that's called discovery. So you have to show the defendant all your cards. If he did it, he don't have to tell us. If he knows about a witness we never found that watched him, he don't have to tell us. There's mutual discovery only to the extent that whatever the defendant's going to use in the trial, he has to give to me or to the prosecution. The prosecution has to give the defendant anything they're going to use in the trial and anything they become aware of 
that might help the defendant, even if they're not going to use it. So that's the way it works. That's what discovery is. It happens the same way in the family court context. They have to give discovery to the parents' attorneys. Professor? Yes. During the discovery, if the defense um, becomes aware of a lot of um, evidence that they were unaware of or that their client hadn't told them about, can they try to encourage the client, if it's like overwhelmingly against the defendant, can they uh, try to encourage them to maybe talk about a plea or not? The question is, if during the trial the defendant and the attorney in a criminal case become aware of evidence that's far more compelling and far more overwhelming than they ever thought about, can they decide to talk about a plea? Now, the answer is yes. However, it's not a question of them finding out about evidence they didn't know about because the prosecution can't put evidence on they didn't know about. Every piece of evidence that the prosecution puts on has to be given to the defense months, if not years, before the trial. So if we walk in with another piece of evidence, they can cry foul. We have a lot of problems, the government. At the very least, the judge is going to adjourn the case or declare a mistrial, and it's not going to be a great day for the prosecutor, believe me, if that happens. Everyone's going to be upset. But if new evidence presents itself, maybe the prosecution didn't know about it or couldn't reasonably have discovered it, the defense is going to have an opportunity to adjourn it or postpone the trial or start completely over so that they can review that evidence and understand what it all means. But sometimes they may have all the evidence, but they don't realize how it sounds when they get in the courtroom. Or they don't realize how compelling a witness is. You know, Joe Logmans went to trial and he read the woman's statements, you know, the John Candy rapist. He read the woman's statements and he knew what the state's evidence was. He rolled the dice. The woman was fabulous. I mean, You know, there was one time where, I forget what the question was. Geist asked her a question about something, about why she did something. And she says, I didn't do it for myself. I did it for my God and for my country. I did it for my husband and my future children. You know, and the lawyers were joking me in the hallway. They said, I, I thought that a drum and bugle corps was going to come in and a violinist to start playing the Star Spangled Banner, the way this woman was responding to him. And I'm changing history a little bit about what really happened, but it was something like that. She got very patriotic and very high, highly dramatic. But Geist is the best. I mean, it's a shame that some of these trials are not on video. Now they video record a lot of these things. One time I tried a murder for hire case and <clears throat> Guy was a friend of mine later, and he was a housing cop. And a lot of my friends knew him, but I became friends with him later on in life. His name was Phil. Phil was a housing cop, and he was dating a girl named Denise. And Denise used to hook up with a guy named Bobby D'Amelio. Now, Bobby D'Amelio ran over a little girl high on coke with two strippers in the car and killed her, so he was in jail. When he was in jail, his cellmate was a guy who used to uh, threaten people up in New York who didn't pay gambling debts, Michael Jabilio. Michael Jabilio was an enforcer for the Gambino crime family. Are you with me? <laughs> All these Italians. Well, Philly Perone was the good guy. He was the housing cop, and he was with Denise. Bobby D'Amelio was the bad guy. He used to be with Denise. But when he got locked up for killing the little girl, Denise starts seeing Phil, the housing cop. And that pissed Bobby D'Amelio off. It really did. And of all the bad luck in the world, his cellmate was Mike Jabilio, the enforcer for the Gambino crime family in upstate New York and some of the boroughs of Manhattan. 
big guy, six foot four, had giant hands like a like he had some sort of pituitary gland problem. They were like baseball gloves, pockmark face, balding, broad shouldered, but as charming and as interesting as you'd ever meet a man. The consummate BS artist, the consummate criminal who could talk you out of your money and your home and your family. Really, just an enchanting human being. Weird looking dude, but the gilded tongue. And I say Bobby D'Amelio had the misfortune of being his cellmate because not only was he a bad guy who would get you to pay up with a look if you were not paying your gambling debts, he also was one of the greatest snitches in the history of the federal law enforcement community. <coughs> Michael Jubilio sold information and got out of jail over and over and over again. And here he was with this pathetic goofball, Bobby D'Amelio, who was just your average cokehead from Patterson who killed a kid. And he's with Mike Jubilio who duped the Irish Republican Army, the Russian Mafia. I mean, his list of informing went back 20 years, and he always talked about writing a book. I should track him, up, track him down now that I'm about to retire. I mean, he helped arrange for the, for the sale of Stinger missiles to the Irish Republican Army. Um, he was involved in a plot to kill a federal judge in Florida, he was an intermediary with the Russian Mafia and the theft of diamonds and jewels in the Diamond District in Manhattan. And, and he did it successfully. And there were more just outstanding, crazy stories about this Mike Jabilio. And here he sat in the same cell with this pathetic cokehead from Patterson. And he's like, this housing cop is banging my girl. I like to kill him. Yeah, you're talking to me. I'll take care of that thing for you. You'll do it for me? No problem, man. What do you want to do? How do you want it to happen? Bang, bang. You want me to hit him in the head? You want me to make it look like a drug hit? Where's this guy work? He's a housing cop. We'll make it look like he got whacked in the project by some gang. Yeah, that's cool. Within a week, he's at the Passaic County Prosecutor's Office. I got this information. Guy wants to kill a cop in our town. Mike Jabilio charmed the prosecutor, charmed me, charmed our chief of detectives. Come on in, man. Yeah, he's going to do it. We put a wire on him. Back then, it was a lot harder. This little recording device here, I wish we had it, you know, in 1994. You put this scratchy wire on his chest and you wrapped it up. He was afraid of nobody, so he didn't worry too much about sweating and things like that that your average person did. We wired him up. You could hear it pretty darn good. He wanted Phil Perone killed and he wanted Mike Jabilio to do it. That was the case. That was the prosecution. So anyway, it gets back to Calman Geist, this attorney who's a great and funny cross-examiner. He doesn't always mean to be funny. He's just so acidic, nasty. But there's a certain joy as a prosecutor and a litigant, and I mean a litigator, and as an attorney watching a master. So Phil Perone, who I later know, comes into court. And he's an average tank kid from the neighborhood. He's not the... Phil's a good guy. He's a housing cop. He wants to be a Patterson cop. You know, there's a housing cop. was the same thing, but uh, it was more special to be a Patterson police officer than a Patterson, a Patterson housing cop. And that was his goal. And he eventually did become a police officer for the Patterson PD, I believe. Anyway, he comes in, and he's got on his full blues his official uniform that you wear for formal events. And he's got on this badge and all these they look like medals. They're all different colored icons and things. He's got it all. Oh, his whole chest is full of this stuff. So he tells his story. He wasn't that big a player in this prosecution because he was just the target. But he hung out at Paul's Bar on Crooks Ave and Clifton and the piece of paper said you can find him there and you know, I know Paul a long time, too. I know Paul's bar. It was an interesting case for me for a variety of reasons. And so I brought Phil, brought Phil in to say, yeah, I, I hang at Paul's bar. That information's correct. Not that I hang there. I go there once in a while. I, I have a cocktail or two. Uh, I'm friends with the owner. And that's my neighborhood. So 
you know, this piece of paper that had the target's name and where he hung and how to find him, how to kill him, was a credible piece of paper. So Bill takes this stand. Geist goes, um, are you going to a parade today, sir? He's like, excuse me? Well, you're all dressed up. Is, it, is there a parade in town that I, that I missed on? I mean, <coughs> wheel the baton with that? that never mind. I have such a lot of questions. His own client, I remember, came to court. We were picking a jury. And you got to remember, this was on the tail end of the 1980s. And it was in the mid-90s, and things are different. People really didn't wear what he wore. I don't know where he got this. He made a motion that he wanted the judge to order that his the jail provide a decent suit for him. And eventually, his aunt bought him something. I remember to this day, she brought in a bag from NBO, which was a men's clothing store that had discount clothes. And she did a nice job. She wore a nice blue blazer and a red tie and a pair of gray slacks. And we saw a different Bobby D'Amelio in front of the jury. But Geist goes, Your Honor, I'm not sure what my client is wearing today. This ill-fitting and peculiar outfit, it, it appears to be from the moon. <laughs> he had on a, like one of these like double-breasted gray with a Nehru collar and baggy, pleated baggy pants and flared, flared out. He was really unusual. It wasn't unusual in the sense that it was gated. And it was really casual and, 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 and from another era. But that's, what he, that's how he rolled, man. That was his nice suit. <laughs> Some guys goes, this, this ill-fitting and peculiar suit that my client's wearing, I, I, need, I cannot pick a jury with him wearing this thing from the moon. In his closing arguments, he called him a ninny. In his opening arguments, he talked about Mike Gibilio, the the enforcer for the Gambino crime family says something like this. And I remember this part well because I remember my opening. You know, you have a few openings in your career that you really like, yeah, man. You know, I, I felt really good about it. I mean, I sat down, I was like, man, I nailed it. I had them. They were raptured. You know, I talked about this woman and running and all that. And I remember one of my phrases. I said, you know, Jody Lynn went that morning, blah, 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 and she it was a day like any other, but this day she felt really good. It was about 62 degrees, the sun was shining brightly in the air, it tasted good that morning, that June morning here. So Geist walks up and goes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You want to convict my guy, don't you? Well, despite the fact that that opening statement was well, well delivered and well told, it's not true, it didn't happen. The state's entire case represents on the word of one man, a convicted thief, pickpocket, leg breaker, bank robber, jewel thief, and snitch. He sells information for money. The problem is, we don't know what Michael Jabilio is going to walk into the courtroom tomorrow. Will it be the Mike Jabilio who lied to the federal government in an IRA, IRA sticker missile case, or will it be this Will it be the Mike Jabilio who wore a clown mask and entered a bank in South Florida and put a Glock 9mm in the mouth of the teller and said, give me all your money? Is that the Michael Jabilio we're going to hear from tomorrow? The one in the clown mask? I don't know. The greatest theater was when Mike Jabilio took the stand and Cal Geist cross-examined. Here you have one of the greatest informants ever walk the earth in America and a really, really good lawyer who's, I don't know who was smarter, Jabilio or Geist. And it was almost a stalemate. And they were so in tune, it was just, oh man, I was watching it wide eyes. I mean, it was not only great theater, but great lawyer. And they were so simpatico. Geist goes to Jabilio, and Mr. Jabilio, Tell the jury what you think about in jail every day, all day, seven days a week, every month, 365 days a year. Go ahead, tell them. He never prepared or practiced this question. He didn't interview Jabilio at length about anything. I don't think he spoke to Jabilio at all. But Dice was so smart, he knew how criminals think. And Jabilio knew what he was talking about. He goes, getting out of jail. Of course. That's what you do for a living. You think up ways to get out of jail, don't you? No. 
Sometimes things fall in my lap. Sometimes I get information. If I get information, that's true. I try to help the government. Really? So they did that kind of thing for a while. Tell the jury what a Stinger missile is. A uh, Stinger missile is a shoulder-launched missile that's used to control airspace. It's typically used to control large areas where you know tanks and conventional armaments don't work. You know a lot about blowing people up, don't you, sir? <laughs> Tell us about the clown baskets. Tell you know. So he got into all that stuff. It was um, you know uh, it was a lot of fun. Isn't it true that you used to break people's legs? when they didn't pay their gambling debts in Nyack, New York, from 1982 to 1986. No, sir, never happened. You never broke people's legs in Nyack, New York, from 1982 to 1986. No, I didn't, sir. Weren't you charged on at least three occasions with breaking people's legs in Nyack, New York? Yes, sir. Don't you... I asked you, sir, whether you... Those, you asked me whether I broke people's legs. I don't break people's legs. I threatened to break people's legs, and they pay up. That's what I did, and that's what I did in IAC. I didn't break anyone's legs. Well, you would have. Sure, I would have, but I never had to. <laughs> uh, 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 excuse me, Mr. Chapilio. I missed the word. Thank you for correcting me. And, and this went on and on and on. It was really good theater and really interesting. And I digressed, haven't I? What was I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Discovery band. He was dressed up like he was in a band uniform. Let me look. Well, whatever it is, I know where I wanted to move to. I wanted to move to burdens of proof. In that prosecution, I had to prove Michael, I mean, Bobby D'Amelio guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I talked about burdens of proof already in this class. Beyond a reasonable doubt, preponderance of the evidence, or probable cause. I talked about that. Well, in child protection, the standard is preponderance of the evidence, 51%. That's what makes it different from the criminal courts, okay? An exception is, and there may be others, but a common exception is termination of parental rights, or what is referred to as TPR. Termination of parental rights. The standard of proof there is clear and convincing evidence, and that's a high standard. That's almost beyond a reasonable doubt. So standards of proof and burdens of proof matter. We talked about how O.J. was found responsible in one court and not guilty in another. Because burdens of proof matter. So in the family court, the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence. I'd like you to take a close look at this reading that you had last time. When we do the exam, I may not have covered everything, but you're responsible for the whole thing. Now I'm going to move to learning project, uh, learning module three, and that's a two-week learning module. What I want to do is address the Megan's Law stuff, the sex offender risk stuff. Now there's an article there by Phil Witt and Natalie Barone, Dr. Witt, Dr. Barone for colleagues of mine. Uh, I'm more familiar with Dr. Witt. Dr. Witt and I were on a task force that helped develop the scale that's used to assess risk in Megan's Law cases. Your next learning project, you're going to do a lot of reading and you're going to assess risk in a case involving a sex offender. That learning project's due, I think, next week. So that's why I'm going to do this one ahead of the other stuff in Learning Module 3. I'm going to start with this so you have a little bit of a extra information hearing me talk about sex offender risk right now. Of course, read the article by Witt Barone if you haven't already. But what's critical is there's a video tutorial that shows you how to do the scale that I did for you guys. And it zooms in and out on the scale and I narrate it. You need to look at that, you need to look at that closely. You need to look at that, and you need to look at it closely. I want you to do a good job. You need to read every piece of discovery, and then you need to apply the scale to that particular sex offender. Now I'm going to go back into the learning project on the big board. you got your special instructions. There's an example there. Read the example. 
You can upload your assignment there. I'd like you to continue what many of you are doing. Copy and paste it inside the text box within Blackboard and also attach it. You can type it right in the text box if you want, as long as it's in a text box. But if you made it in Word or some other program, give me that file as well as pasting it in the text box. Your case file is in this folder. Here's the video that tells you how to apply the scale that I narrate, I told you about. And here's the scale up on the big board. And I'm going to address that right now because that's the most important aspect of your learning project. Brief overview of Megan's Law. The government is not allowed to knock on people's door and tell them that sex offenders are in their neighborhood. Only in a small subset of cases are we allowed to do that. In fact, there's what we call a graduated system of notification. Graduated meaning starting low and moving a little bit higher. It's incremental. All sex offenders are Tier 1. T-I-E-R. Tier 1 is a low risk. Everybody's a low risk when you get out of jail. Then we have to evaluate where you fall. Do you still a low risk? Do you stay as a Tier 1? Or do you move up to a 2 or a 3? Depending upon risk, we notify the community. The higher the tier, the more persons and institutions are notified. The broader the notification. So Tier 1, we simply notify the police. We notify the police where you have a substantial presence. So it's not only where you live, but it also might be where you work. So if you live in Patterson, and you work in Kearney, and you have a shore house in Briel, Briel, we're going to notify the police in all three of those places, right? Because you have a substantial presence there. If you go up to Westwood, New York once in a while to go BS with the guys at the Suzuki dealer there, you don't have a substantial presence there. You might be in Westwood once or twice a month, but that's not enough to go tell the Westwood cops or the Westwood people about you. It needs to be a little bit more substantial than that. So my examples are you have a shore house, you work somewhere, obviously where you live. So if you have a presence in the community, you're going to notify those cops in those communities on a tier one. That's it, just law enforcement. So in my example, law enforcement in Brielle, Kearney, and Patterson would get a notice. That's it. Tier one, low risk. Tier two, higher risk. Same cops, same notice. But now we tell places where there are vulnerable populations. Those are my words, but that's pretty much it. Kids, battered women, Right? Maybe the cognitively or emotionally disturbed or impaired, if you live near them. So tier two, we tell the cops in Kearney, the cops in Patterson, and the cops in Brielle. We also tell all schools and daycare centers automatically. Automatically. All schools and licensed daycare centers. And you have to be licensed in New Jersey. So now, cops, Kearney, Patterson, Brielle, and schools and licensed daycare centers, right? All schools, parochial, uh, uh, public, private, uh, Jewish, Muslim, whatever kind of school it is. If it's a school and they teach kids, you get a notice. Community organizations, you got to ask. If you run a dance studio on Main Street in Brielle and little girls congregate there every night, we don't know about you. You've got to tell the Monmouth County prosecutor that your dance studio is on Main Street in Brielle and you want to notice. If you don't affirmatively apply, you're not going to get notice. But they would be a good candidate to get a notice if they apply. Because maybe boys, boys and girls, congregate there periodically, and they're vulnerable. 
So automatically included are daycare centers and schools. Other organizations have to apply. And that's it. We tell those organizations and the cops in Briella, in, in Kearney, and in Patterson. And that's it. If you're a tier three, the highest risk, the highest risk, we same groups in same three communities in my example, but now we go door to door. We go door to door and we notify people within a reasonable proximity of their job or their summer house or their primary residence. And you know, typically that's a thousand feet in the city, uh, half a mile in the suburbs, and two miles in a rural area. And that's what the appellate, that's what the appellate division approved. And that's pretty much the way prosecutors do it around the state. And it happened, come, happened to come from my county. The sergeant and I sat in a conference room one day, and I said, well, why don't we make it this? My analysis was, I said, how far would you have to go for a pack of cigarettes and a Coke? If you're in a city, you probably don't have to go further than 1,000 feet. Now, I've been all over Patterson to say a million times in my life originally from Newark, so I know the city pretty well. I know if I wanted a pack of cigarettes, it's probably a bodega or something a thousand foot away. My neighborhood's a little smaller in the city. Now, I moved from Newark to Livingston. I grew up in most of my younger years in Livingston. That was suburbia. I had to get in the car and go about a half a mile to the 7-Eleven. And while I never lived in a rural area, I had friends who lived in rural areas, and I knew that if you wanted to get a pack of cigarettes, you had to drive two miles sometimes. So that's the numbers we came up with. Health division liked them. It became the de facto standard in New Jersey for the zone of notification. Now it could go in or out depending upon natural boundaries, rivers, lakes, factories, you know, mountains. You're not going to go on the other side of a mountain, if, even if it is in the two-mile zone in a rural area. So how do you determine whether there are one, two, or three? How do you determine risk? We use this scale. And that scale is what you're going to use in your learning project. I do a pretty thorough job in describing the scale on that video. Much of what I say at this moment is going to be repetitive. However, it may bear. There's always a few students who simply miss it. Maybe they weren't listening closely. I recommend you take notes. I recommend you print this out and take notes in the margin as I recite what these things mean on the video. And if I say something two or three times, it's probably important. All of these categories, one through whatever the end of one is, 12 or whatever, I forget, we'll see in a minute. All of these categories on the left have been shown to have a correlation with repeat offenders. People who use guns or knives or brutality in raping someone are more likely than the average sex offender to be a repeat offender. There's a correlation between using force and doing it again. And that's what we're trying to figure out. What kind of person is this? Is this the kind of person who did it once and learned their lesson? Or are they the kind of person who would do it again? Now this is more, well, it's part art and part science. The science of it is we've done studies. They looked at rapists to use weapons and rapists who didn't use weapons, and they found that rapists who used weapons repeated more than rapists who didn't use weapons. So there's some science there. Now, there's some art as well. You have to think about these things. You have to make determinations about whether this was a weapon or not. Uh, does it mean look a weapon? Is a guy waving his hands forceful? You know, there are issues that arise in application all the time. Risk assessment is really basic. It's no different than what meteorologists do. Bless you. Or what the general manager of a baseball team does. You know? The New York Giants, for example, are going to have to do not so much risk assessment, but they're going to have to forecast the future a little bit. What do we pay Victor Cruz? What do we pay Bradshaw? People whose contracts are up, or people who they may become a free agent in sports, you got to predict what they're going to do in the future so you can pay them right, or keep them there, or figure out what other people might pay them. What's the best predictor of the future? 
when it comes to human behavior? The past. Very good. The past. <clears throat> what you did in the past, it's not always right, but it's as good as it gets, right? Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So a guy who's got a couple of molests is more likely to offend than a guy who's only molested once. Nobody's saying that he's going to molest. It's just that, is he more likely to molest? We're assessing risk. Risk is potential to do something else. Not that you're going to do something else. So this whole form is about applying risk factors and drawing a conclusion about whether the guy that you're looking at is more likely to offend, again, right, than someone who doesn't have the attribute that you're examining, than someone who hasn't used force, or hasn't gone after a kid under 13. So the first criteria is degree of force. That doesn't present too many problems. It tells you, among your things, there's a manual for how to interpret this. You need to go to that manual and look it up when you don't know. Say, hey, a guy, you know, a guy made a fist and said, oh, I'm going to get you. Well, is that a weapon? Is that a use of force? I don't know. Maybe. Knuckles are pretty powerful things. Let's see what it says. Remember, these are just shorthand for the manual. No physical force, no threats. Well, I'm going to get you. Well, that's not that. That's something. Threats or minor physical force. Okay, it feels like it's in the middle. Violent use of weapon. Significant vis no violent semicolon. Use of weapon, semicolon, significant victim harm. Well, it probably doesn't fit in number three. Well, what about if the guy is a former middleweight champ of the world? Is that in category three? Is his fist a weapon? What if the vic well, maybe. What if the victim knew he was the former middleweight champion in the world? Maybe. Maybe this fist belongs in category three, right? It's not so clear. Change the facts. You know what you do when you don't know where it quite fits on this scale? Look in the manual. Now, the answer's not always there either, but it's better than this little shorthand that's in these boxes. Look at the manual. Look at what the Rees rationale is. Well, weapons tend to scare people more and make them more compliant. People who use weapons and attempt to scare people more and put them in mortal fear for their life are more likely to reoffend because they are psychopaths and they have uh, no empathy for other human beings. But people who don't use weapons are more seductive and they use grooming and seduction to molest. So if that's it, and I'm kind of making that stuff up, but if that's kind of, it doesn't say that in the manual, you say, well, the boxer who knows it's a weapon, and she knows it's a weapon, he doesn't give a damn about her. He wants to put her in mortal fear. That's the functional equivalent of a knife. Okay? He's, he feels more psychopathic than a guy who doesn't use it. I'm going to put him in box three. As long as you can articulate why you put him in box three, you're almost there. So, number two, degree of contact. People who penetrate are more likely to offend than people who don't. Penetration isn't always obvious. Suffice it to say that, and I taught you this, right? Oral sex is penetration. Sex on a woman, uh, oral manipulation of the vulva uh, is, a, is, is, is penetration. Uh, putting the mouth or licking the penis is penetration. Any kind of oral contact with the genitalia of another is penetration. Certainly fingering and intercourse is penetration. Fondling under the clothing in the middle. No contact or fondling over the clothing is a low risk criteria. Not many problems there, but you've got to read the file. Age of the victim, it is what it is, right? You know, it ought to be somewhere in the discovery. We call that the discovery. Victim selection. House, family member, acquaintance, stranger. Well, that's one that can get a little dicey. You know? We know what the parameters are, right? This one makes the most sense. You don't have to be Phil Witt or Natalie Barone or some fancy psychologist or expert on risk assessment or assessing violence, future violence, to figure this one out. The guy who molests his stepdaughter or his niece or the, you know, uh, the tenant on the first floor is relatively less likely to reoffend than the guy who attacks strangers. Excuse me. The guy
guy who attacks strangers, by definition, is predatory, right? Predatory means you're like an animal. And animals are predators. They need, you know, wild animals, they need meat to survive. When a tiger out in the, uh, you know, the jungles in India gets hungry, they go walking around looking for something to eat. Got nobody specific in mind, they're predatory. They're going to eat, they're going to get hungry again, they're going to do it again. The guy who lives in the house, less likely to reoffend. That's what we call a situational or opportunistic person. They're probably not going to reoffend again. They took advantage of this kid because the kid was there. It was easy. The kid was vulnerable. And they exploited that vulnerability. Both of them are bums. This isn't about saying one guy's better than the other. We don't make moral judgments about who's better. We make judgments about who's more likely to reoffend. They're both despicable. But the guy who looks for victims is more likely to reoffend. By definition, that's what he does. Looks. Now, the acquaintance is something different. That falls in the middle. But what's an acquaintance? If you meet a girl at the bus stop, if you meet a woman at the bus stop, a young woman, and you chat her up, and you invite her back to your house or your apartment, to check out your new iPad free, and then you attack her. Is that an acquaintance? Probably not. <clears throat> what if you know her from around, uh, you know, I know her from around the block. I know Jenny from the block. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. It's not always in a discovery. <laughs> How do you know this guy? I know him from the block. I don't know what that means. I know what it means, but is it an acquaintance? Did you talk to him before? What about if you take the same bus every day and you chat up with this young woman every day at the bus and eventually you get up to the energy to say, you want to come by and look at my new iPad 3? Does that now become an acquaintance? Does the, uh, the amount of times you chat someone up make an acquaintance? Who knows? It's not that clear. That's what I look at. I look at how many times they communicated, what they communicated about, what's the nature of the relationship. You know, one time it was really important that this guy become a two. He didn't want to be a three, a tier three. And, you know, he was very close. And the defense argued against me on a couple of these points. One of them was victim selection. This was a guy who was a multimillionaire, so he was able to finance uh, one of these trials rather easily. He made a lot of money speculating in sugar, for whatever reason, the commodity of sugar. He used to work for the Domino Company in the Caribbean. And he lived for a time in New England, I think in Vermont or something. And most of his molest happened in Vermont, Vermont, and they involved teenage boys. And his lawyer argued that these were acquaintances, even tried to argue that they were virtually household members. Here's what he did. He was, his wife died, he was a single 60-something-year-old man, and he needed yard work done. He needed lots of yard work done. He had a big piece of property up in, I think it was Vermont or New Hampshire. And the local boys, 16, 15-year-old kids, who somehow he encountered, that wasn't too clear, but he knew a couple of their mothers, so that's what the lawyer was trying to argue, that these were more of a quaint. Oh, he knew their mothers, some of them. Some of the boys, he did know their mothers, and they brought other boys who said there was yard work to be done. Yard work is really diminishing. He wanted them to move earth, build things. And he needed them there two or three days a week, and he paid good money. And he also built dorms, if you will. I call them dorms. His lawyer just said spare bedrooms, guest rooms. He, he had four or five, maybe I'm overstating, two or three beds, bunk beds and sleeping quarters, custom built in his basement. And these kids came over and they hung out. And he had tons of porn and firecrackers and 